How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Verse 44 is a question. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Answer, you can't. You can't. That's the answer to that question. You can't. You can't believe. Like we could make it a statement. You cannot believe in Jesus with genuine, authentic, saving belief and faith if you are seeking the praise and the approval of man and not the glory of God. You can't believe. And it's interesting because if you look at the crowd in Jerusalem, they have the same issue. At the root of their lives is a craving and a desire for human approval. Look at what this says in our text. In chapter 7, the last couple of verses, 11 to 13, it says the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While well, some said he's a good man, others says no. He's leading the people astray. Verse 13, yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly about him. Nobody openly, nobody publicly would say, I believe he's the Messiah. I believe he is our Messiah. He's the one that's come to save. Nobody would say that. Why? Because of a fear of the Jews. This crowd craves the approval of the Jewish leadership, and they're fearful of the consequences of their disapproval. And that's the same issue that's at the root of his brother's unbelief. Pride is still at the root of their hearts. They have not yet died to themselves. Therefore, because they've not died to themselves, whatever it is that they believe about Jesus, that belief is defective. That's heavy. That is unbelieving belief. John chapter 7, we are going to read verses 1 through 13. It says, After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand, and so his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly about him. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Father, once again, we thank you. What a privilege it is to come and to gather around your word and amen you may be seated of all of the uh, different Jewish celebrations and feasts there probably was not one that was more exciting uh, and and more fun to participate in than the feast of booths sometimes it's referred to as the feasts of tabernacles uh, or even by its Hebrew name Sukkot which was the, that's the, the Hebrew word, the, the, the Feast of Sukkot, um, which really just means booths or, or tents or tabernacles. The, 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 the Feast of Booths was the last of the fall festivals. It was held at the end of the agricultural year, uh, at the end of all of the harvests of the grapes and the olives and the figs and all, all that stuff, pomegranates and all that. Um, but we see it instituted in Leviticus 23, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 39. It says, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid trees. I love the splendid trees, as opposed to the boring trees. These are the splendid trees. 
um, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Everybody say rejoice. You shall celebrate it as a feast of the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statue forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. When we go back and we read the ancient historian Josephus, um, we find that he actually said, he lived during this time, and he said that this feast, the Feast of Booze or Tabernacle or Sukkot, was the most important, most significant, most joyful of all of the feasts. The, the Feast of Booze or Sukkot was a time to thank God for all of his provisions, uh, to pray that they would have a good rainy season going into the winter. But primarily Sukkot had a, had, a, had a very specific purpose. It was designed so that the people would remember the wilderness journey, how God had brought them out of Egypt and, and, uh, and into the promised land. And during that interim, as, the, as God was leading his people around, they lived in a tent. They lived in tents or, or they would live in a booth or the, the Hebrew word was, was sukkah. They would live in one of these. And so during the time of the feast, uh, Israelite families would basically construct another booth or a, a sukkah and they would live in it for these eight days. They were basically small temporary shelters. They had like thatched roofs made out of palms and they were decorated with all different kinds of produce and fruit. Uh, that grew in the area. Uh, there was music. There was dancing. Uh, I mean, and this stuff went on into the night. This was just basically a rager that went on for seven days, right? This was just, it was fun. And the feast culminated on the last day with a water drawing ceremony and the illumination of the temple was happening. But the entire feast was one of joy, is one of celebration, uh, really of, of God's provision to his people that he had not only provided that year's produce, but that he had taken care of them in generations past throughout the desert. As a sidebar, just something that I find interesting, there are some theologians that actually believe that the birth of Christ was very close to or may have even coincided with the festival of booths. We celebrate, of course, um, you know, Jesus' birth in December, uh, but it's highly unlikely that the 25th of December was the actual day that Jesus was born. Um, it's unlikely that shepherds would have been in the field tending to their sheep that late in the winter. And some actually believe, remember in uh, John chapter 1, verse 14, uh, some actually believe that this is what John is alluding to here. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. And, and we talked about that word when we were back in chapter 1, what, six, seven months ago, uh, that, that this was, this word that he dwelt among us was literally, it literally means he pitched his tent among us. Some of you may remember that. And there are those who believe that John actually is intentionally using this word to associate the first coming of Christ with the Feast of Tabernacles, that, that as everybody's building their, their tents, that Christ came and pitched his tent among us as well. Ultimately, we don't know for sure. Um, I just throw that at you as a by the way, because I find that just fascinating. Uh, so hopefully that blesses you. If not, you can feel free to forget it. Um, nevertheless, the Feast of Booths was, was a very, very um, exciting festival. And it's about to begin uh, when chapter 7 begins. We are told, if you remember, back in the beginning of chapter 6, in verse 4, that the Passover was at hand. That's what chapter 6 verse 4 says. The Passover was at hand. That's when the feeding of the 5,000 took place. That's when... Um, you know, the, the, the traveling across the sea, the walking on water, and then the long engagement, discussion, argument, fight that developed out of that as Jesus was teaching in Capernaum, right? So that was chapter 6. That happened while the Passover was at hand. Everybody know what time of the year the Passover is? Springtime, yes, I heard it. I heard somebody say springtime. Happens in the springtime, right? So after this, this is during the Feast of Booths. That would be, that would put this chronologically, that would put these events when chapter 7 begins about six months 
after the events of chapter 6. So between the end of 6 and the beginning of 7, we've got about six months' time that have, that have spanned. And it's interesting because John doesn't tell us anything of what happened during this six-month time. Nothing. Like he just says, after these things, and, and then we just go on to chapter 7. He doesn't even allude to it. Uh, we can get some of those details from the other gospel writers. Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all tell us things that happened during that time. We know that after this confrontation in chapter 6, that he actually went to the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, to this farming area known as the Plain of Gennesaret, and he healed a whole bunch of people in that area. After that, he had a conf- another confrontation with the leadership, with the Pharisees, over tradition, over Jewish tradition specifically, because the Pharisees came to him and they're like, your disciples don't wash their hands in the proper way before they eat their bread. And so there was a fight among that and there was conflict that Jesus had with those leaders. We know that Jesus went all the way up the coast of Lebanon uh, to Tyre and to Sidon. There was a woman up there uh, who had a daughter uh, who was demon-possessed, and the mother came to Jesus and begged him to do something, and Jesus ended up healing that girl. Uh, Jesus then came back down into the region, and he fed another group of people doing a a similar uh, miracle. He didn't feed 5,000 men, and then plus the women and children this time. He is actually 4,000 and men plus women and children. So he did that. And then Jesus went up north to the area of Mount Hermon uh, to Caesarea Philippi. And it was there that he asked his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is? Who do men say that I am? And of course they responded, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're the prophet. Like, and, and Jesus turned it on them and says, well, who do you say that I am? And it was at that moment, remember, that Peter jumped up and says, you're the Christ. You're the, you're the Son of the living God. Right after that, Jesus announced that he was going to be going to Jerusalem and he was going to be killed. He was going to die on a cross. This was the first time he had ever told his disciples that just plainly, uh, what exactly was going to happen. Of course, they didn't really understand it even then. They were confused about it. Um, While they were there, Jesus took a few of his disciples. He took Peter and James and our author, John, these three men. He took them up on the mountain, and Jesus was there transfigured before them. These three men saw the glorification of of Jesus' human body radiating with the glory of God as bright as the sun. And they heard the voice of the Father say, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Then after that, Jesus goes back down to the region in southern Galilee. He heals a man's epileptic son because the the disciples were unable to do that. And John, so this is what was happening during the six months. And John mentions none of it. None of it. Which is interesting. But remember, John is not writing an exhaustive chronological account of the teachings and the works of Jesus. What is he writing? John 20, he tells us in John chapter 21, he says, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. And I'm thinking about this six month period going, you don't say, right? There are also other, many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. In chapter 20, verse 30, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, the things I've picked out, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I say all that to say this and remind you, John is being very, very selective about what he wrote, right? If I'm writing this, I'm going to write about the transfiguration. If I'm one of three people that witnessed something that nobody else got to saw, I'm going to be writing about the transfiguration, right? I'm going to be writing about that. That's just, that's just me. Of course, I'm not an apostle, uh, and, and my pen is not, you know, guided by the Holy Spirit. But, but I would have wrote about that. I would have wrote about a lot of this stuff. It's, they're amazing stories. And this is instructive to us regarding not only what John did include, but what he didn't include. Understand this, we are pretty far along in Jesus' ministry. I know it seems like we just started the book, we're only just now getting to chapter 7, but I would tell you this, as far as the chronological timeline of Jesus' ministry, 
by the time we get to chapter 7, most of the earthly ministry of Jesus is done. Okay? There is an intense hatred toward Jesus that is going to take him to the cross in six months. Six months from the beginning of chapter 7, right? Six months from the moment that we are reading about today, Jesus will be crucified. He will be hanging on a cross. There's just, there's so much that, I mean, you get this picture that John, the first part of his ministry are several years, and we've just sped through them, including very little about, uh, about the, the, the circumstances and the situations that happen. And John is not a long book. And, and John, our author, didn't want to waste words. John wrote precisely what he wrote. He curated that these specific experiences and stories in order to say something very specific so that his readers, which includes you and I, by the way, so that we would read it and that we would see it and that we would believe. That's, that's his point. He's not including everything. He's including this so that we would believe. So with that, let's look at chapter 7, verse 1. It says, After this, Jesus went about in Galilee, which is, again, Galilee is northern Israel, uh, around the Sea of Galilee. You have the, the towns and cities of like Nazareth and, and Cana and Capernaum and Gennesaret. And, and says he would not go about in Judea, which was way down south. Anybody know the name of the big city in Judea? Jerusalem, right? This is like the epicenter. Jerusalem is the epicenter of the nation, right? He would not go down to Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Verse 2, now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand, so his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you were doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So here we are introduced to Jesus' brothers, right? They're his half-brothers, if we could use that terminology. These are the boys of Mary and Joseph. So when after Mary gave birth to Jesus, her and Joseph had other kids. And, and we can actually turn to Matthew chapter 13, uh, verse 55. It actually gives us their names, right? So we have James, okay? James is going to eventually become a Christian. Uh, he's going to write the book of James that you have in your Bible. Uh, then there's Joseph. Most of the time these are given like in, in, you know, from oldest to youngest. So underneath James, we've got Joseph, uh, who evidently had the same name as his dad. So we'll call him Joe Jr. Okay. So we got Joe Jr. And then we got Simon. Now it's important. This is not Peter, right? This is not our, our disciple Simon. This is a different Simon. And then we have Judas. And of course, we have to clarify, not Iscariot, right? This is a different, this is a different Judas. Judas is actually the long form of Jude, right? His name was Jude. He would actually write the book of Jude that you have in your Bible. Um, I, I'm just speculating, but maybe uh, you know, after the whole thing with Iscariot, he was like, you know, I'm not going to go by Judas anymore. Just call me Jude. Uh, maybe, I don't know. So we got James, we got Joe Jr., we got Simon, and we got Jude. And they are very excited about Jesus' miracles, right? They're, they're excited about their brother. They're excited about, they have no doubt seen some of the miracles, They've witnessed some of the miracles. They were probably there at the wedding in Cana. They, they, they're, they're excited about miracles. I mean, we, we all get excited about miracles, right? And they're, they know that these can only come from God. And, I, and, and you kind of look at the text and there's almost like this, you can just imagine this excitement like, Jesus, that's my brother. You know, that's, that's my brother, Jesus. And so the brothers just, they want one thing. They want everyone else to be able to see what they've seen, to witness Jesus in the way that they've witnessed Jesus. And so they're like, listen, Jesus, leave here. Like, leave Galilee. You're crazy just to kind of stay in this area. Uh, leave all these little backwater rural villages. There's nobody that lives here anyway, not very many people. You need to go down to Jerusalem. You need to go to Judea where there's large crowds of people. Uh, go down there. I mean, the Feast of Booths is happening right now. There's literally going to be millions of people inside Jerusalem, go there and let everybody else see what you can see. Let everybody else see the kind of miracles that you can do. 
verse 4, they say, For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And probably one of the most shocking statements in chapter 7 is verse 5. And it says, For not even his brothers believed in him. This would have been shocking for John's first century readers to hear, right? Because they knew James. By the time John write this, James has been the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, the lead pastor there after the resurrection. They all knew Jude. I mean, these are, these are Jesus' brothers. Histo- history and, and tradition tells us that all of his brothers would come to know Christ. All of them would become believers. And at this point, evidently, they're excited about Jesus and they're willing to say, hey, you need to go, but, but, but they don't actually believe, right? His brothers, were they're excited about the miracles. They're, they're trying to encourage him to go to Jerusalem, show yourself to the world, do the miraculous, supernatural stuff. Like, come on, Jesus, let's, let's go. We'll, we'll go with you. Let's all go together. Come on. For not even his brothers believed in him. That's such a strange sentence to throw into the text. You know, I mean, you're reading it, and it's like, it's like, whoa, I, I didn't see that coming. I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of unbelief later in the chapter, right? The, the Jewish authority is threatened by Jesus' rise in popularity. They don't like his miracles. They don't believe in him, right? They do not believe in him, and that's clearly evident from the text. But this, this is startling. It would be one thing if his brothers were like, listen, Jesus, we don't think your miracles are real. We think it's all smoke and mirrors. Uh, Would you stop drawing so much attention to yourself? You're an embarrassment to the whole family. Dad's dead. Mom's at home. Come with us. We need to go take care of mom. And if that's what the text said and then added on to it, for not even his brothers believed in him, you'd be like, okay, I get it. But this is different because there's, there's an enthusiasm about his miracles. There's an excitement about the fact that he's doing all of these supernatural things. They believed in his miracle. They believed he could do all these things. They were amazed at it. They, they loved it. They, they want him to make an appearance in Jerusalem so that he can win more amazed followers. And the Bible tells us that that is unbelief that that is not belief that will save. And I think that John includes this statement in verse five so that we'll think about that. Like, so that we'll think about exactly what we're going to be talking about this morning. And that is, what is belief? What is the nature of belief? And what is the nature of unbelief? I mean, John's been clear. Again, the name of this series that we've titled is So That You May Believe. And John has been clear throughout the entirety of the book. John 3, 16. Help me out here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. That's what happens when you don't believe. When you don't believe, the wrath of God is on you. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever, what? Believes in me shall never thirst. John 6, 40, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son, and what? And believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. A verse we read just a little bit ago, John 20, 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. (laughs) And yet we have a group of people here in his brothers who believe, but they don't believe. Well, what's the big deal with that? The big deal is if, the, if they get this wrong. 
if they don't get this addressed, they go to hell. We're talking about a real hell. We're talking about real people for a real eternity. A place that the Bible describes that it would have been better for a person not to be born than to go here. A place of fire, of eternal punishment, of infliction of the divine vengeance of God, a place of destruction, outer darkness, the unshielded wrath of God. The Bible calls it a second death. God's righteous vengeance and wrath against those who have exchanged his glory and rejected him. I know people struggle with the reality of hell, but think about this. Do you think the God of all glory, do you think that the creator of the universe left his glory and condescended to his creation's level, was born in a dirty stable for farm animals, ended up on the garbage dump of a cross, bearing under the, the fire of God's wrath just to be rejected by peons, by ants. That's us, by the way. Pe peon, ants who are totally dependent upon God for our very next breath. He sustains us by the word of his power and who are at the same time prefer our own lusts and our own rebellion and our own appetites to him. And we trade him and we exchange him every day for lesser things. Like just what is a just judgment for somebody who would rather scroll past the king of glory on their phone and, and, and instead glory in their own shame? What's a just punishment for that? In the book of Jeremiah, God speaks in Jeremiah chapter 2 and he calls upon all of the angelic beings and he says, be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've hewn out cisterns for themselves. Cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They've forsaken the fountain of life and they've tried to find satisfaction in lesser things. Romans 1 says, claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Now here's the thing, we have all done this. Every single one of us have done this and, we, and we're tempted to do it all the time. When, when we trade something, when we exchange something, we are communicating value, whether we agree with it or whether we like it or not, whether we realize it or not. Every trade, every act of exchange conveys value. When, when we go buy something at the store, right, it has a price tag associated with it. And if we value the item, for what we value the price, then we're willing to make that exchange. Or perhaps it's on sale and we think it's a good deal, and so we're willing to make that exchange. Occasionally, we'll see something that we like, and we look at the price tag and we say, I don't value it that much, right? I mean, if I had, I, I <laughs> so, <laughs> if I had a $1 bill, I used this illustration during first service and it went bad, but I'm gonna try to use it again. If I had a $1 bill, in first service I said, and you had a $100 bill, I'm gonna, I'm gonna level that up. And you had a $1,000 bill, okay? If I had a $1 bill and you had a $1,000 bill, and I said, hey, let's make a trade, straight up. Straight up, right? First service, somebody brought in a $100 bill and just stuck it up here, and I'm like, I don't even know what to do with that right now. But if you had a $1,000 bill, and I had a $1 bill, would you be willing to make that trade straight up? Well, the answer is no. No, right? Now, we may trade things like that. We may do trades like that with our kids, right? We may like, all right, give me, give me your $1 bill and I'll give you a $10 bill. You know, we do things like that with our kids all the time. But we're willing to do that because it's not the, the value that we are finding is not in the trade. The value is in their joy right? The value is in the smile on their face when they're like, yeah, I got a $10 bill. You know, I mean, my kids are older. They don't get excited about $10 bills anymore. Um, 
But you, you never, listen, you never exchange something you value for something you value less. You don't do that. You never exchange something you value for something you value less. You always are willing to trade something you value for something you value more. You, you exchange, if I, if I have something and I'm willing to exchange it, it's because I don't want that, I want that. Uh, you want the other thing. You want that, you don't, you don't want this. And the problem is that's what we do with God. We look at his glory, we look at his power, we look at his wisdom, we look at his beauty, and we are not overwhelmed by his greatness and we're not overwhelmed by his magnificence and by his majesty. We aren't just bursting out in praise. We actually hold all of that and we say, I'm going to trade it for something I want more. Every time we sin, every time we sin, we sin because in that moment, we're not valuing Christ. We're valuing the satisfaction of the sin. Friends, that's why hell exists. That is why hell exists because that exchange is an infinite sin. It is utterly sinful. You cannot do anything worse than that. And every sin is an expression of that exchange. We, when we do that, we're, when we reject Christ, when we do all of this, we, we are effectively saying, Jesus, you are not attractive to me in this moment. You are not satisfying to me. I get no pleasure from you. I, I, this, this over here is my desire. This over here is my treasure. And that is evil. And it is deserving of hell. But the promise of the gospel comes to us. Paul says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul would write to his son in the faith, Timothy, his first letter to him in chapter 1, verse 15. Paul says, this saying, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. Acts 16, 31 declares, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. In John chapter 5, we read this. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. But see, that brings us back to our original problem. Because clearly John wants us to believe, but yet we see here that a person can believe something and not believe. What, is it, what does it mean to believe? What is, it, what is the nature of belief? What is the nature of unbelief? Or what is the nature of this kind of belief that is what we might call unbelieving belief? The belief that his brothers had, where they believe and they're excited. What, what's the nature of unbelieving belief? I am convinced that John's inclusion of verse 5 I'm convinced that this is the question that John meant to have his readers ask. What do you mean they did not believe in him? It's shocking to us. And I, and I believe in all my heart that this is what John wants us to look at so that we would believe. The problem is we have so dumbed down what belief is, especially in our Western American evangelical Christianity. I think oftentimes what passes as belief is almost unrecognizable to authentic biblical belief. So again, what is belief? What is false belief or what is unbelieving belief? I mean, is belief 
Is belief just simply a, a mental assent or an affirmation to a particular doctrine, right? We would say something like this. I believe in the total depravity of man. I believe in man's helplessness to be able to save himself. I believe in the sufficiency of Christ and his atoning sacrifice, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Is just saying yes to all of that and signing your name, is that belief? See, I would argue that that is not necessarily genuine belief. Belief is not just a mental agreement with the facts of Christianity. That's why you can't just say to somebody, listen, believe this, say these words after me, now you're saved. It's not that simple. It's not that hard, but it's not that simple. See, if all that was required for salvation was orthodox gospel facts, if all that was required for salvation was orthodox gospel facts, we would be forced to conclude that Satan and all of his demons are saved. Because they, I would argue, they have a fuller knowledge of the identity of Christ than you do. Satan was there. He was there in the beginning. He knows who Jesus is. Satan knows who Jesus is. The devil is absolutely orthodox in his belief and understanding in the incarnation of the Son of God in the person of Jesus Christ. To believe orthodox facts does not mean genuine belief. Does not mean saving belief, not necessarily. And I know it's always shocking when I say things that I'm about to say, and I'm not a shock jock. I don't, I'm not just trying to shock you. But I'm going to say it anyway because I think it needs to be said. Praying a prayer, asking Jesus into your heart, signing your name on a card does not mean that you have authentic belief either. I dare say there will be a lot of folks in hell who have prayed a sinner's prayer. Jesus' brothers, they believed in something. They, they, they believed, but there was, there was something defective. There was something lacking. There was something deficient in their belief, right? His brothers want him to go to Jerusalem, show his miracles to the world, but he refuses to go, and he says, no, I'm not going. And then he goes. But, but John draws attention to the way that he goes, right? Which is a very different way than what his disciples, or than what his brothers uh, wanted him, the way that they wanted him to go up. And none of that is an accident. Okay, so let's read it in the text so we can see it there. Verse 3, so his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, go to Jerusalem, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. Come on, Jesus, let's go. We'll, we'll all go together. Not going. And I think what he means by that, I think, I think the way that we have to interpret that is, I'm not going up the way you want me to go up. You, you've got this whole scenario worked out that you want to see happen. James, you've got ideas in your head. Jude, you've got ideas in your head about, you've got your own motives, you've got your own desires in your mind that you've built up about what this is going to be like and what this is going to mean for you being my brother and getting there and all this hoopla. And, and I'm going to go, but I'm going to go my way. I'm not going up like that. His, his brother's motivations, their desires, their ideas about why he should go. What, what happens when he goes and what is that going to mean for me? That is 
That is all defective. That's all sin. That's, that's unbelieving belief. They don't believe. See, Jesus is here and he's saying, listen, I'm going up to die. That's, I'm going up not to, not to be the leader of a... I'm going up to die. I'm going up to lose my life. They're going to hit me. They're going to pull out my beard. They're going to whip me. They're going to spit in my face. They're going to mock me. They're going to brutally torture me. And then they're going to nail me to a cross and I'm going to die. I'm going up as a lamb to the slaughter. Like they want Jesus to go up with miracles and a show. And when he goes up, he's going to go up secretly and then he's just going to teach. And they want him to go up in this full display of his miracle working power so that they can maybe live vicariously through him and be like, this is our brother. Come check out our brother. Yeah, you know, come talk to me because I've known him for a long time. I can tell you things about him. Just here, maybe if you come talk to me, I can get you kind of a private meeting off to the side. And like they're going up with this attitude that's like, come see my brother. They're full of pride and they're trying to manipulate the, see, the situation to see how they can get glory out of this. And Jesus is like, I'm going up to die. And, and there, you don't even have anywhere in your brain. You've got no space for a savior who's going to die for his people. In verse six, Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. Jesus looks at his brothers and he says, listen, you go up. They can't hate you. They hate me because I, I testify about them. When I speak, they seethe with rage. Not you. They're not going to do that with you. You are just like them. They're not going to hate you. You're literally just like, you're driven by the exact same thing that they're driven by. And that is the praise of men. More than anything, you desire the praise of man. At, at the root, you are all driven by the same thing. And that is, look at me. Look how great I am. Look how holy I am. Look how godly I am. Look how close to Jesus I am. I got here because I did this and this and this and what's going on with you? And all of them are driven by pride. The pri that, that desire in us to boost ourselves up, to make ourselves seem great so that it can fill the, fulfill this universal craving that we have to be liked and to be admired and to be praised and to be esteemed. And Jesus is like, you want me to go up and become more and more famous because you want to be the brothers of somebody who's powerful and popular so that you can share in my popularity and my power. And you can't even, you can't conceive, you can't submit to how radical what I am going to do is. I'm going to choose rejection. I'm going to choose persecution and scorn and shame and suffering and death. And you can't see that. You can't submit to that because of your love affair with the praise of men. Now, I got to tell you, this hits me personally really, really hard because I battle with this all the time, every day. I do. I, I have a great desire. <laughs> I, I really, let me say it this way. I really like the fact that you guys like me. Just being honest. One of the hardest seasons of my life was preaching from a pulpit to a congregation of people where half of them really didn't like me at all. That's hard. And my father-in-law was so encouraging to me. My wife was so encouraging to me. And there were a few others. But there was a bunch of folks that did not like me. But as difficult as that season was to go through, I look back on it now with fondness because it was good for me. It was good for me to learn how to preach to an audience of one. So that when I stand up and preach now, I learned not to care what you people think of me. Now, don't get me wrong. I really like being liked. I told you, I struggle with this. I battle with this. 
And at times it's more intense because I like to be liked. And probably you're the same way. The issue is what's at the root. John chapter 5, remember this, verse 43 and 44. Jesus says, I've come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Verse 44 is a question. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Answer? You can't. You can't. That's the answer to that question. You can't. You can't believe. Like we could make it a statement. You cannot believe in Jesus with genuine, authentic, saving belief and faith if you are seeking the praise and the approval of man and not the glory of God. You can't believe. And it's interesting because if you look at the crowd in Jerusalem, they have the same issue. At the root of their lives is a craving and a desire for human approval. Look at what this says in our text. In chapter 7, the last couple of verses, 11 to 13, it says the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While well, some said he's a good man, others says no He's leading the people astray. Verse 13, yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly about him. Nobody openly, nobody publicly would say, I believe he's the Messiah. I believe he is our Messiah. He's the one that's come to save. Nobody would say that. Why? Because of a fear of the Jews. This crowd craves the approval of the Jewish leadership, and they're fearful of the consequences of their disapproval. And that's the same issue that's at the root of his brother's unbelief. Pride is still at the root of their hearts. They have not yet died to themselves. Therefore, because they've not died to themselves, whatever it is that they believe about Jesus, that belief is defective. That's heavy. That is unbelieving belief. And so we ask the question, well, what what is belief then? How do I I know if I've believed? I want to believe. I don't want to go to hell. Well, the answer is not that difficult. The answer is everything we learned in chapter 6. He must be bred to you. He must be the object of your heart's desire. Him, not the benefits. Not the blessings, Him. If if you come to Christ because you're afraid of hell, you haven't really come to Him. If you come to Christ because you're trying to impress somebody or you're trying to win someone's approval, you have not believed. Jesus is not a means to an end. I think I've said this before. There are so many people that would be content. Like, they just don't want to go to hell. So they want to go to heaven. And if Jesus is there, great. If he's not, that's not belief. Jesus is not a means to an end. He is the end. He is the goal. Heaven is heaven because of him. He's the prize. And if you come to Christ for any other reason than because he's infinitely worthy and because he's glorious and because he alone is your heart's treasure and you want to be satisfied in him and you want to be filled with all of the fullness of God and he's your portion forever. If you come to him for any other reason than that, you have not come to him. Now listen, as your pastor, I don't want you to leave here I don't want you to leave here wondering if what you have is belief. I don't want you to leave here questioning whether or not you're going to heaven. Folks, it's coming. Eternity is coming. What is the measure of a man's life in relation to eternity? It's coming. And I want you to leave here with a confidence that when you die, you get Christ.
Back in 6, chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So our believing and our, our coming to him has to be in a way where he satisfies our desires and our, and our heart and all of our affections. And if, and if we're not coming to Jesus in that way, we've not believed. We've not come to him. See, what's often missing from so many people's belief is not only believing that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. Again, Satan believes that. But it's also, it's being satisfied in him. It's delighting in him. It's him being your ultimate and your supreme treasure. Belief is not just seeing him as the Messiah. It's seeing him as infinitely valuable and glorious. It's not just an acknowledging of the fact that he is God. It's seeing him as precious and desiring to see him glorified. Satan knew who Jesus was and he hated him. The brothers knew who Jesus, they knew he was from God, and yet in all of that, they craved glory for themselves. The crowd loved Jesus at times, but they loved the approval of men more. And even the Jewish leadership at times could admit that he had to have come from God because he couldn't do the things that he did without it. But they saw him as an immense threat to their own value and their own power. But see, when the Holy Spirit begins to work inside a person's heart and work inside a person's life and, and makes us alive to him and, and, and there's a stirring in our spirit where we're like, whoa, and, and we see things. He opens our heart and he opens our eyes. He gives us a new heart. We're not deceived like that anymore. We recognize that our value is nothing compared to his value. And we would forsake everything and lose it all for the sake of Him. And we recognize that our will and our choices is nothing compared to the will of God. And we're okay with that. Instead, we just want to know Him. We want to be with Him. We want to enjoy Him. We want to follow Him. And well, listen, while at times we still may struggle with that, and at times we may even fail miserably at that. At the root of our lives, at the foundation of our lives is a contentment and a satisfaction for all that Christ is for us. And that, that transition, that change of heart, that looking away from myself and looking toward Christ and embracing all that God is for us in him and being satisfied in that. Listen to me, that's what faith is. That's what belief is. And that's what saves. We have pictures of God in our head that are far too small. He is great. He is glorious. Think of the opening of C.S. Lewis's Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and they're speaking of Aslan as a type of Christ, and, and uh, Miss Beaver uh, looks, at, looks at the kids and is just like, oh, he is not safe. He is not safe. God is not small. He's not safe. He's good. He's mighty. He is powerful. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 tells us, Therefore God has exalted him, highly exalted him, and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every person ever will bow their knee to Jesus. Some will do it out of love and adoration and some will do it because their knees are broke with a rod of iron. But every tongue will confess. We, we often approach God, we approach matters of faith in just such a cavalier way as if Jesus Christ and our faith and our obedience to him as the Lord God Almighty is something that we can just put off and we don't have to think about today. We don't got to deal with that today. We can save that for another day. And we come up with a million reasons why. I'm going to get my act together first and then I'll do that. It's not how it works. One of these days, 
fire and lightning is going to fill the sky from the east to the west, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. And there's going to appear in the clouds the Son of Man, the God-Man, with his mighty angels in flaming fire. And at that moment, every eye will see him very clearly. And whether from terror or sheer excitement, we will tremble and we'll wonder how we ever lived so long thinking so little of him and so much of ourselves. I know that there are some here today and you do not have genuine saving belief. And you know you don't. You know you don't. And as promised, I want to give opportunity because while you know you don't, or maybe even you think you don't, he's not your treasure. He's a means to an end. He's an escape from suffering. But you want to have true belief because God's doing something in your heart. Then as promised, I want to pray with you. So I'm going to ask you right now to come right up here with me. I don't do this often, but I am going to appeal to you to do it now. I don't care whether you're 12 years old or you're 90 years old. If this is you, if I'm talking to you, if your heart is, if your heart is beating and you know you need to respond, then I just want to invite you up right now. Don't wait, just come. 